Evet, değerli üyelerimiz, dünyamız COVID-19 pandemisinin yanı sıra iklim krizi, doğal kaynaklarla ilgili yaşanan kayıplar, sosyal eşitsizlikler gibi pek çok sorunla karşı karşıya. Önümüzdeki 10 yıl daha iyi bir geleceği kurgulamak için çok kritik hale geldi. Bu süreçte de iş dünyasına önemli görevler düşüyor. Çatı örgütümüz WBCSD Mart 2021'de Vizyon 2050 Dönüşüm Zamanı başlıklı bir rapor yayınladı. İlk versiyonu 2010, 2010 yılında yayınlanmıştı bu raporun. Biz de SKD Türkiye olarak Türkçe'ye çevirmiştik ve yaptığımız çalışmalarda bu rapordan yararlanmıştık. Şimdi raporun yeni versiyonu sürdürülebilir bir dünya için önümüzdeki 10 kritik yılı yönlendirmek amacıyla iş dünyasının rolüne odaklanıyor ve çözümle ilgili yol haritaları sunuyor. Biz de bugün Çatı Örgütümüz WBCST işbirliği ile Vizyon 2050 raporunun detaylarını sizlerle paylaşmak istedik. Raporda 9 eylem planı sunuluyor. Bu eylem planlarında enerji ve gıda konularında e, neler yapılabileceğini e, ele alacağımız atölye çalışmaları kurguladık. E, böylece e, siz değerli üyelerimizin sürdürülebilirlik stratejisini, hedeflerini belirlerken Vizyon 2050 dönüşüm zamanı raporundan nasıl yararlanabileceğinizi deneyimletmek istiyoruz. Ayrıca atölye çalışmalarında tabii pek çok fikir de çıkacaktır. O fikirlerin önümüzdeki dönemde SKD Türkiye olarak yapacağımız çalışmalara yön vermesini istiyoruz. Bugün aramızda yönetim kurulu üyemiz Sabancı Holding İnsan Kaynakları ve Sürdürülebilirlik Grup Başkanı Hakan Timur da var. Hakan Bey düşük karbon ekonomisine geçiş ve verimlilik odak alanımızın eş başkanı. Aynı zamanda WBCSD'nin holding olarak Türkiye'den tek üyesi. Hakan Bey hoş geldiniz. Buyurun söz sizin. Gonca Hanım estağfurullah çok teşekkür ederim. Sağ olun. Bir herkesi her şeyden önce sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Ee, çok uzatmayayım. Bence siz çok güzel tanımladınız. Ben e, her şeyden önce Sürdüle Bir Kalkınma Derneği e, yönetim kurulu adına da tüm arkadaşlarımız adına da bugünkü katılımcıları ve bugün zamana yararak burada oldukları için hem sevgiyle selamlıyorum hem de teşekkür ediyoruz. E, bence bugün önemli bir gün çünkü Gonca Hanım'ın dediği gibi Sürdüle Bir Kalkınma Derneği olarak tabii gerek üyelerimiz gerekse açıkçası hem iş dünyası hem toplumun her kesiminde e, sürdürülebilirliğin ve daha iyi bir gelecek için çalışmanın ne kadar önemli olduğunu anlatmak, farkındalık yaratmak bu anlamda gelişmek çok önemli ama bunun içerisinde de diğer önemli bir faktör var ki bunun için doğru vizyonu, doğru hedefleri de koyabilmek doğru alanlara da odaklanmak da gerekli. E, çünkü her şeyi de bir arada yapamıyoruz ama doğru odak alanlarıyla e, doğru bir yapıyla birlikte çalışmamız İstediğimiz etkiyi yaratmamız açısından çok kritik. Ee, ve Gonca Hanım'ın da dediği gibi e, WBCSD bu anlamda e, çatı, uluslararası anlamdaki çatı kurumumuzda tabii çok uzun zamandır bu konularda çalışan, çok geniş bir ekiplerine ulaşan ve çok yakın zamanda 2050, Vizyon 2050 programını da açıklayarak bu konuda önemli bir adım attı. Onun için hem bu programın ne olduğunu anlamak, görmek, iyice değerlendirebilmek WBCSD'nin bu konudaki tecrübelerinden, deneyimlerinden yararlanabilmek, dolayısıyla bundan faydalanmak ama aynı zamanda da bu programda da açıklanan ve önerilen konulan, öneri olarak ortaya konulan alanlardan da hangilerine önümüzdeki dönemde hep birlikte daha fazla odaklanmalıyız, hangilerine birazcık daha farklı kaynak ayırarak ya da önceliklerimiz içerisinde koyarak e, doğru bir organizasyonel ya da doğru bir yapılanmayla çalışırız belirlemek açısından bugünkü workshop'ı çok önemsiyoruz. E, bu çünkü bundan sonraki gideceğimiz yol açısından da e, ve bence derneğimizin gerek üyeleri gerekse toplumsal anlamda sağlayacağı katkılar açısından da önemli olacak. E, ben bu anlamda da tekrar dediğim gibi sağ olun söz verdiğiniz için bu toplantının çok faydalı olacağını WBCST'nin Deneyimlerinden ve tecrübelerinden bugün ve bundan sonra da birlikte daha fazla ayarlanacağımızı ama bugün katılımcı bir şekilde bu çalıştayda ortaya çıkacak olan odak alanlarının da bundan sonraki faaliyetlerimizi şekillendirmek açısından önemli olacağını ve bu Haziran'ın da bu grubunda bu anlamda önemli bir katkısının olacağını düşünüyorum. Tekrar katılım için ben de hepimiz adına e, genel sekreterimizde 
e, Gonca Hanım da dedi ama yönetim kurulu adınıza da çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. E, ve sözü tekrar sizlere bırakıyorum Gonca Hanım. Çok teşekkürler Hakan Bey. Şimdi Vizyon 2050 raporunun detaylarını paylaşmak üzere WBCS'de Vizyon 2050 direktörü Julian Hill Landolt'u mikrofona davet etmek istiyorum. Julian, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are looking forward to listen to you. The mic is yours. Thank you very much, Congre. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Very yeah. well. I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for a moment, everyone. Okay, I hope everyone can see uh, what's on the screen. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to join you uh, today. I don't know what was said, so I'm sure it was very interesting. <laughs> um, and I uh, and I don't know whether I've been introduced, but I'm going to assume that everyone knows what WBCSD is, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, and I'll just say that I'm Julian Hillandel, the one of the original co-directors of this update to Vision 2050, and now the person responsible for uh, rolling Vision 2050 out um, over the course of this year and beyond. Uh, I've got a lot to get through, so I'm not going to um, spend any more time on uh, our, our work with BCSD Turkey, but of course it's an honor to, to be with you all um, again. And uh, so without further ado, I'll move into this presentation on Vision 2050. And my, my plan is to basically give you a quick overview of why uh, we decided to update it and then run you through the five main sections of the report in, in just enough detail uh, to show you what's in it and how it's valuable to you uh, before you go off into your, into your breakout groups. But it, it has to be said, this is a huge piece of work. Um, it's very hard to explain to you its, uh, its richness and its depth in, in the short amount of time that we have together today. But I will do my best. So uh, the background to Vision 2050. So for those of you who, um, who don't know, uh, this latest incarnation of Vision 2050 is actually an update on a piece of work that was done back in 2010. Uh, it was a groundbreaking piece of work for the time. Um, it was the first time that anyone had really tried to say, well, what does a sustainable world look like? Uh, how do we get there? What is business's role? In, in driving that, uh, that journey. It was also um, the first time that business had really turned around and acknowledged publicly that business as usual was no longer an option um, and that transformation of, of everything was required in order to reach uh, this vision of 9 billion people living well within planetary boundaries by 2050. The original uh, involved um, just under 30 uh, members, um, and it was split up into nine pathways. This is sort of the, the, the main takeaway from that original report, this, this journey to a sustainable world in 2050, split by um, challenges and industry sectors, and also split by two distinct timeframes, the turbulent teens, as they called it, uh, that would be the, the period of turbulence during the 2010 to 2020, when all of these transformations uh, bubbled around and we tried to figure out how to actually set ourselves up for, with the, for the changes that were required, followed by a period of sort of calm uh, between 2020 and 2050, which they called the transformation time, when we would implement all of these massive changes that we'd worked on uh, during the turbulent teens. The reason that we decided to update Vision 2050 is because we're quite clearly not out of the turbulent teens. And so it was important for us to understand why, uh, even though progress had been made uh, over the, the last decade, that progress had not been sufficient to actually get us to where we, we needed to be. And so back in late 2018, uh, we proposed to the Exco that we should update Vision 2050, um, and, and then we got approval to do so. So we launched the, the project in April 2019, and our, our goal was to uh, update Vision 2050 to um, provide business with a, a systems transformation approach uh, that gave companies a collective and comprehensive understanding of the transformations that the world needed, 
and how those transformations could be brought about. We wanted to provide them again with a common narrative about what work needed to be done, but how that needed to be grounded in both opportunity and business reality uh, so that CEOs and leaders could, could leverage that confident that they were, share, they were aligned um, on what they were working towards. We wanted to provide companies with a key strategic input that they could use to define how they would uh, adapt their businesses to um, uh, changing uh, environments, changing landscapes, uh, and also changing uh, regulations as, as we collectively uh, understand that we, we, we need to, to change what it is that we're doing, that business as usual still hasn't been disrupted and still needs to be. Um, and, and then finally, a catalyst for engagement, whereby companies could use this piece of work to bring together uh, those, um, those uh, partners, policymakers, customer suppliers, whatever it might be uh, that they need to in order to help drive transformation at the rate and scale required. Um, in the end, we got uh, 40 uh, companies. There are 38 logos here because two um, didn't want their, their logos to be shared, but we got 40 companies to take part in the project, uh, representing a good cross-section of, of industries and geographies. Um, and we worked together in the normal WBCSD way, as you'll be familiar with BCSD Turkey as well, of bringing companies together to work collaboratively on addressing, uh, finding out the answers to some of these tricky challenges and then presenting a, a, a guide for companies uh, to work from going forward. We also uh, engaged global partners uh, around the world. This, uh, this was supposed to be a more extensive uh, series of, of global engagements, but they were cut rather short by um, the pandemic. And so many of the planned uh, engagements around the world had to be either moved online or cancelled. Um, but we did make sure that we were seeking a global view. We were getting global reactions uh, to the research that we were doing as the project went along and not just uh, coming up with a, with a sort of a European or a North American view of the changes that were required. And then finally, to keep us uh, honest and credible, we also uh, put in place uh, an external uh, review committee made up of some of the most recognized um, thinkers uh, and thought leaders in the, uh, a range of different challenge areas from human rights uh, to nature, to climate action, to food, uh, and making sure that we had uh, a good global uh, and um, diverse uh, set of um, uh, thinkers, making sure that the ideas that we were coming up with were, were accurate and valuable. And then finally, just a, a, a, a to mention the, the, the, the buy-in that we had from our senior leadership here at, at WBCSD. So the, the report in its, final, um, in its final state was signed off by uh, all of our EXCO members and the, the project members. The project members were, were made up largely of, uh, of executive committee members, but they all uh, signed up um, to this leadership statement at the beginning of the uh, of the report, so 42 uh, uh, CEO and board level uh, signatures um, acknowledging uh, the the value of the piece of work um, when it when it was finished. So, with that said and done, I'll move on to an overview of the of the of the piece of work itself. So. We call Vision 2050 a, a framework uh, for sustainable business action in line with the challenges that we, we face as global societies. Um, the sort of one of the unofficial taglines of the work is that it provides companies with what they need to know about how to run companies well, well into the future, which is a, a play on words in English, but essentially it's all the whole point of this piece of work is to show you what it will take to run your company prosperously um, in to the, well into the future, so in the long term. There are five main sections to Vision 2050, which uh, you see the, the, the chapter headings here, time for a shared vision, time for action, time for a mindset shift, time to succeed, and time for leadership. And what I'll do now is I'll go through each of those five sections in a little bit of detail to give you a flavor of what's held within this framework 
uh, for action. But essentially, the way that you need to think about Vision 2050 is it doesn't have all the answers that you need. It doesn't tell you what you, what you have to do. But across any challenge area uh, within, within business, we provide you with the, the main building blocks that you need to be thinking about if you're going to take action as an individual company, and then also how you ensure that that action that you take can be translated into impact at scale within society. Okay, so starting off with time for a shared vision. Our vision didn't change um, in, in this update. We kept it at 9 billion people living well within planetary boundaries. We just added a little plus to the nine because it's, uh, it's very clear that, um, uh, that the population will not stay within 9 billion. Um, the main thing we did in this update was we expanded greatly on what that vision actually means. 10 years ago, uh, the science was far less settled around the planetary boundaries. We were less mature in our thinking around uh, what it meant to live well. Today, we're in a much better position to actually say, no, according to you know, the latest science or the latest uh, policies being put out by bodies such as the UN or, or leading governments around the world, we can define clearly what it means for people to live well and for people to live within planetary boundaries. And so our, our report starts off with precisely that. It's what it means to live well. And at the top line, that's everyone's dignity and rights are respected. Basic needs are met and equal opportunities are available for all. And we have five uh, sort of fundamental features of, uh, of what, it, what will bring that kind of living well about. And then for living within planetary boundaries at the top level, that's global warming is stabilized at no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Nature is protected, restored and used sustainably. Societies have developed sufficient adaptive capacity to build and maintain resilience in a healthy and regenerative Earth system. And again, we break that down into eight fundamental features of what will bring about our ability to live within planetary boundaries. But the idea here is just that in any of the actions that we outline within the report, we always keep our eye on the prize. This is our shared vision. This is what we're working towards. We're working towards a world in which people can live well, and this is what it means to live well. And we're working towards a world where people live within planetary boundaries. And this is what it means to live with, within planetary boundaries. So if your actions aren't contributing to that, then you're not taking part to the extent that you need to uh, in these transformations. Because essentially the argument here is that for business to succeed, it depends on thriving uh, societies to trade with and a healthy planet on which all of us can exist. So we have to bring those two things about if we're gonna to continue to prosper into the future. I'll skip through this quite quickly. I'm hoping on this call that everyone understands the urgency of, this, of the situation, but we have a, a short section uh, following that vision where we outline how urgent transformation is. We show how it's still possible, but that the situation is serious and that the action really must be taken this decade. And we give some facts and figures around the climate crisis, uh, we give some facts and figures around nature loss, we give some facts and figures around mounting inequality and show how these things are, are ever um, increasing their impact on businesses' ability to operate uh, successfully and prosper prosperously. And then, of course, we also um, have to spend some time talking about COVID-19 uh, and, and the effect that that will have over the, over the following decade. But the main uh, takeaway to point out here is that, um, is that the, it is the most vulnerable in society that are hit first and worst by any crisis, uh, and COVID-19 is no different. Um, but cl climate change's effect on things like temperature, sea levels, precipitation events, further loss of habitat will all contribute to uh, increased risks to the most vulnerable in society, first and foremost, and also uh, highly likely increase the risk of future pandemics and economic and public health impacts that flow from those. So then we move on to what's really at the heart of the report, the nine pathways held within our section called Time for Action. And so here we, did a complete rethink on the way in which we'd organize the pathways in the original Vision 2050. 
In our original, they were very much based on the industry sectors represented by the members who were taking part in the project. This time round, we wanted to say, well, what is the most logical way of explaining the changes that need to happen to business, but in such a way that it makes sense for society as well? And so we started with a list of sort of 135 sectors, which I think is what you, the, the number of sectors listed if you go to Wikipedia and say industry sectors. And then we tried to combine them down. And then slowly but surely we realized that actually the way to do this was not to think about sectors, but was to think about the essential things that society requires. So food, health and well-being, water and sanitation financial products and services, living spaces, you know, where either urban or rural, but the built environment that we live in, transportation and mobility, energy, and so on and so forth. These are the things that society requires and therefore that business exists to provide into society, meaning that we are working on changes that are both uh, uh, that generate business activity and therefore continue to uh, help us to fund you know, economic activity in general, but that are also required by society. This list is not completely comprehensive, but it's as near as it can be. I think the only thing that is absolutely absent uh, from, this, from this list is um, leisure and entertainment, even travel and, um, and uh, vacations, for instance, are held within the transportation and mobility uh, and the living spaces. Um, pathways to some extent. So it's as comprehensive as it can be uh, to allow us to actually segment the actions that need to be taken whilst being relevant to both business and society. The other main thing that we wanted to make sure that our pathways did was to, was to translate what can be quite uh, an impenetrable um, set of uh, goals and targets represented by the SDGs for business into something that was actionable for business. So in every case, what we do is whilst we focus on the transitions and actions required within a given pathway, we show business how those actions relate to specific SDGs um, and specific targets within SDGs so that business can see and show that the actions that it takes by following the guidance of Vision 2050 are in line with achieving the SDGs going forward. Let's skip past that. So I'll just give you a quick graphic overview of how each of these pathways are, are put together. And I've, you'll be discussing them in, in two of them in more detail uh, uh, in the breakout. So I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially each pathway is built in the same way. We have a top line vision that, it, that provides uh, what, uh, a, a short statement of what we want the situation in 2050 to be for that particular societal need and how that societal need will be met. We break that vision down into four components that give a bit more flavor of what it will take to bring that vision about. We then lay out seven transitions and it's always seven, that's just how it came out, which are comprehensive uh, which provide a comprehensive overview of the critical changes that have to occur on the road to 2050 for our vision to become a re reality. Um, so those really do describe everything that needs to happen for that vision to, to come about. And then we provide business with prioritized action areas that it can focus on over the next 10 years I'm going to unmute myself. Someone muted me. Um, the, the 10 action areas are, uh, are not comprehensive because, as I said, we work in collaboration uh, with businesses. You'll, you'll understand how that works from your work with BCST Turkey. Um, there were 40 members. We had to get 40 different companies to agree on what the prioritized actions would be. So we're very clear that the 10 actions we propose for 2020 to 2030 aren't comprehensive, but if every company got on with driving change in those 10 areas, then we would be absolutely on the road to transformation at the kind of scale uh, that is required. And then finally, as I just said, we link each, um, we link the actions to the relevant SDGs. 
So all of our nine pathways are introduced uh, in a positive way. This is a, as I said, we were looking to show business that there is um, opportunity and the, the changes that we're proposing should be aspirational, inspirational. So every pathway uh, begins with uh, a positive statement such as for energy, we can power a net zero world uh, for connectivity, for that's a, a bit obvious, for products and materials, we can make things better for food, we can provide healthy diets for all. Every pathway starts off with one of those positive statements. And then, as I, as I said, they're broken down in the way that I just described. So you're gonna go through energy and food later, but the main thing to mention here is that you'll notice when you, um, when you start having your discussions later, that firstly, um, the transitions are comprehensive, they describe, a full range of changes that need to take place. Um, and they cover a full spectrum of, uh, of uh, transformations that are required, not just uh, technological ones, but uh, collaborative industry-wide uh, initiatives that need to be taken, um, infrastructure that needs to be put in place, and also, uh, you know the sort of the just transition elements uh, of these uh, of these transformations that that need to be factored in and ensured uh, and focused on as much as the the the more technical policy regulatory economic transitions that we're we're advocating. And then you'll notice in the action areas that you've described that again there will be actions that focus very specifically on on technologies and innovation. There will be actions that focus on the behaviors or actions of individuals that are required. There'll be actions that um, focus on specific policies and of course, on where investment is coming from. And it's important to, to always bear in mind those, those different areas uh, of activity uh, as those are what drive corporate action uh, to societal action. And so when, when you go through the breakout later, you'll be talking about um, a lot of how those enablers, which I'll be talking about in more detail in a second, of, uh, of technology, of finance, of individuals, of um, policy, uh, enable the, the, the, the, the real transformation to take place uh, within, within these pathways. So just wary of the time, I think, I think the cutoff for me was... Uh, was 10 to, but tell me if I'm wrong, Conker, but I'm gonna assume I've got about 15 minutes uh, left and I'm gonna carry on sailing through um, my presentation. Yes, please. Uh, Julian, uh, I just uh, didn't mention, uh, but I also would like to tell uh, to our members that we are going to translate uh, this uh, uh, report also into Turkish uh, with your uh, kind support. Yes, exactly. So uh, we're delighted to be um, working with BC. The whole document um, into Turkish, because I realize that um, a lot of this uh, language is, is quite technical and, it, and it's incredibly important that people are able to understand it uh, to its fullest extent. extent. So that's why we're, we're one of the things we're doing this year is translating uh, the full document into into a number of different languages, including Turkish, Chinese, French, uh, Spanish, um, uh, Hungarian, Finnish, so, and many more. So yeah, that will be with you in the coming uh, months, I hope. Okay. So moving on, time for mindset shift. Now this is one of the areas of the uh, that is most uh, well, is newest and uh, and most different from from other pieces of work that you will see out there. Um, I one of one of our our global network partners suggested that this part of the report was was too conceptual and not concrete enough, and I I disagree entirely. This part of the report is is really what change boils down to. So essentially that. The pathways, any one of you from any one of your companies, you can go into a pathway and you can 
uh, pick the pathway that's most relevant to your business. You know, if you're a logistics company, you can go and look at transportation and mobility. Uh, if you're a, a food company, you can go and look at food and you can see a, a, a reliable set of actions that you can start working on today. You can see the transitions that they need to support. You can see the vision that you're aiming for and you can start chipping away at those actions. But actually, in order to drive those actions to the extent required, in order to have your companies invest in the transformations that are required, to understand that you know, the tr these transitions that we're talking about do require investment, they will incur costs, and they somehow have to be paid for at the same time you know, as you carry on being profitable today. To do that, you have to think about these mindset shifts that we've outlined. And we've basically made the argument that any of the actions uh, that we describe in the pathways will only be able uh, to result in transformation if companies also shift their mindsets around these three critical strategic business mindsets. Uh, they're called the three R's as a shorthand, but it's basically the reinvention of capitalism. And I, I will pause for a moment in a second on that. It's not saying we don't like capitalism, but a reinvention of the current model of capitalism, understanding that our current model is producing outcomes that are unsustainable and that we need to transform to a model that rewards true value creation. In other words, Um, as a first step, and then two further mindset shifts. One around what it means to be a resilient business in the long term, and in essentially enhancing companies' capacity to anticipate, embrace, and adapt to changes and disruptions in order to safeguard their long term success. And if you're willing to rethink what it means to be resilient in the long term, then you actually start to think about what your resilience depends on, and that will drive you to become a company that has a more regenerative mindset as well. And so moving beyond a mindset of where you're trying to minimize the harm or the negative impacts of your operations or your products and services, and move to one in which you build the capacity of the social and environmental systems that you depend on so that they heal and ultimately thrive, because that is what it will take for your business to succeed in the long term. So we lay out these three critical mindsets for both the, the capitalism mindset shift and the resilience mindset shift. We back these up with quite extensive um, issue briefs that you can go and read about, but they're, they're, these are very brief sections within the report where we're not trying to overload companies with too many demands or lists or things that they need to do, but we just want to make sure that they understand that ultimately, if you want to succeed, the real success will depend on these three mindset shifts. And so for capitalism, we describe what a reinvented capitalism would bring about. It would be more well-run companies that make better decisions, that deliver the necessary product, service, and business model innovations that generate true value and contribute to a flourishing society. It's about capital markets that properly value inclusive, sustainable business practices and that reward those companies that have the greatest positive social and environmental impact. And it's about mobilizing capital towards those businesses, assets, and solutions that deliver the most sustainable outcomes and create true value for society. And essentially what we do is we don't pick a horse. We don't say that capitalism must change in this way. We just say, if you look at all of the different types of capitalism uh, ch changes that are being proposed to capitalism, they fundamentally all share five features. And that is that capitalism becomes more stakeholder oriented, that it becomes more impact internalizing, that it becomes more long-term, that it becomes regenerative, and that it becomes much more accountable. So essentially, just to be absolutely clear on this, 
WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, is committed beyond all others to uh, how business will provide the necessary leadership for these transformations to take place, how capitalism is a fundamental engine of, uh, of change, transformation, and ultimately prosperity, but that the current outcomes of the current model need to be reinvented. And that's why this section is there. And if you reinvent capitalism to be more stakeholder oriented, impact internalizing, long-term regenerative and accountable, then you will see the need uh, to also think about how you uh, improve your ability to, to operate resiliently in the long term. We show how uh, resilience isn't just about um, protecting yourself from change, but actually it's far more about understanding that change is inevitable and setting yourself up as a company so that you can react to change, but also so that you can influence how change then manifests itself in the future situation that we are in. So we try and explain that there are these elements of uh, these four key characteristics of diversity, of modularity, of cohesion, and ultimately of adaptability that make up companies' ability to be more resilient and show how those elements through things such as the way that you manage risk, uh, the way that you um, uh, integrate ESG into your business practices, the way that you manage your social and human capital, how you can use uh, a more resilient mindset uh, to ensure that your, your, your approach to those things sets you up as a business better able to react to change, better able to uh, prosper as change occurs. And then finally, the regenerative mindset. Now this area is, uh, is the newest of areas of thinking in the sustainability space. And you're gonna hear it increasingly over the coming years. Uh, we didn't put it in there to try and create a brand new um, thing that companies have to think about, but we wanted to make sure that companies understood that this is gonna become uh, a key way in which um, policymakers, civil society, and ultimately forward-thinking businesses think about the approach that they take to driving sustainability. And we wanted to make sure that by putting it in Vision 2050 and putting some very clear guidelines around what regenerative means and what it, uh, what it is for business, that the, we could help the, the, the debate to move in a, in a constructive direction. Um, from, from the early stages. And actually one of the pieces of work I'm doing this year is putting some more thinking about this regenerative uh, mindset in place. But essentially all you need to know is that the, the main thing here is that a regenerative mindset is a bit of a journey and you can, you can be in any place on that journey and contributing to it. It's not something that you have to sort of jump through hoops in order to get from one level to the next. But essentially, we do set up these layers of, of how companies can begin to think about where they are on this journey, from risk mitigation through to net zero, which is essentially about sustaining uh, the current status quo by doing no harm, through to net positive or restorative business practices, which is about pursuing um, uh, the uh, ideals that heal um, uh, harms that have already occurred, and then finally, regenerative is where you build the capacity of the systems you operate in to self-sustain uh, and to, to work towards ever greater abundance. This doesn't just apply to agriculture. This is about how you think about the communities you rely on. It's how you think about the, the raw materials that your businesses um, uh, generate value from. Uh, so really, this is just the sort of the final piece of the puzzle about how you set your business up to operate uh, prosperously well into the future. And so that's the section on these three mind sections. And so the final section, just keeping an eye on the time uh, uh, of the, the sort of core part of the framework is this section on time to succeed. And that, this is where we really look at how you go from taking action as a company and translating that into action within society. Um, and so, 
the, the first thing we actually did on the project was to try and understand how systems change. Because absent an understanding of systems change, it's almost impossible for us to drive, understand how to drive systems transformation. Uh, again, there's a detailed issue brief if you're interested in this that you can go and read uh, that we put out about uh, how, how um, systems transform. But essentially, it boils down to uh, three fundamental factors. Uh, the first is that we have a current system and it's perfectly optimized to generate whatever outputs uh, it, is, it is creating. Every time you hear someone say the system is broken, you can actually go, well, hold on, is it? Or is it just working perfectly? It's working perfectly for, for, for, for the way that everything within that system is currently set up. You may just not like the outcomes of that system. And so it's not the system that's broken, it's the outcomes that you don't like. So if you don't like the outcomes, then you have to change what's going on in the system in order for it to, to generate different outcomes. And that's basically all that this diagram is trying to show here. In any given system, there are two major factors that can influence what's going on within it. One is macro trends. So those things that are happening out there in society, uh, and that can include sudden shocks or disruptions. Um, and secondly, innovations that are pushed into the system, and those could be technological, they could be societal, um, it doesn't, you know, cultural innovations as well, political, whatever it might be, but something that comes into the system and changes the way that it operates. And then once you've got those two things influencing the way that a system's operating, then there are these five enablers of transformation that can take that, uh, those kernels of change and translate them into a system that actually changes. And those are the norms and values within society, the way that people behave effectively, uh, the policies and regulations that govern how society behaves, the way that information flows around uh, a, a society, I'm saying society here, but you know, any system, it could be a company as well, uh, the way that finance flows around that system and the technology that governs how that system operates. So if we want to think about how we translate the changes that we, we, we've, the actions that we've identified in our pathways into uh, societal impact at scale, we need to think about macro trends, innovations, and enablers. And so this section really just uh, lays out uh, a helping hand to you about how to think about these different things, okay? It doesn't give you any answers because these are obviously vast topics. But we explain how uh, we've, what some of the most um, significant barriers to transformation were over the last decade, looking at those enablers of change. So looking at societal norms and values, looking at policy and regulation, looking at information flows, financial flows and technology. What were the things that held back the change that we thought we could achieve? Then we did a, a huge piece of work. Again, there's an issue brief, brief uh, two extensive issue briefs three extensive issue briefs around this, uh, one on the underlying research, one on the actual macro trends and disruptions that will affect the next decade, and one on how COVID-19 will affect the next decade. But basically laying out what the main macro trends emerging over the next decade would be. So the macro trends are those things that are, to, to a given extent, baked into the system already, and we looked at it by demographics, by environment, by economy, by technology, by politics, by culture. These are effectively the landscapes that, will def that your businesses will be operating in. So trying to understand how changes at a societal level will determine the way in which you have to do business, which is the first step to understanding how you're gonna approach sustainability challenges. And then we also lay out 10 of the major disruptions that we think businesses should be pre prepared for because there's a likelihood that they could occur, even if it's not a high likelihood. And if they do occur, they will have a massive impact on your ability to run your businesses full stop, not just uh, react and adapt to the sustainability transformations that, that we need to push through. And then we've, we also have a piece on the, the, the innovations that you, that you might see coming out over the next 10 years as well and how they could shape society. And all of that then leads to this main section, main part of the section, which is on these enablers. And essentially what we're saying here is that multinationals need to be bold enough 
to lead and actually large companies within within nation within countries also have that same power they need to be bold enough to lead their supply chains their partners their competitors their their um their customers whatever it might be in in addressing these challenges but they also need to be humble enough to understand that, that there's a, a limit to what they can do by themselves it's not good enough for business to use this language of of powerful leadership without uh, the humility of uh, uh, of coalition and collaboration as well. And these four enablers represent those places beyond the company's walls where that will make the difference between company taking action and that action resulting in impact within society. And so we look at innovation and technology and show how innovation processes that set goals around social and environmental impact as well as anticipate and avoid negative unintended consequences will be good for society and will lead to more resilient business models. We look at finance and investment. We basically try and show how companies need to find ways to direct investment towards socially and environmentally and, of course, financially sustainable outcomes. We look at individuals and consumption. We, we try and remind everyone that there, that in many cases, individuals are actually the ultimate implementers of any, uh, of any solution, of any positive change. And so you have to work with them in mind from the word go. We show how policy and regulation is absolutely critical to any change taking place uh, in a meaningful way and how business needs to rethink its approach to forward thinking and progressive policy making. And then in each case, we provide companies with uh, four main ways in which they can try and uh, unlock transformation through this enabler. And we don't really have time to go through it today. You're gonna, you're gonna be spending time in your breakout groups discussing uh, the, these enablers. And I've provided uh, the leaders with slides that, that have these, um, these uh, the, the breakouts on each of these enablers for you to work with. But essentially, if you take innovation and technology uh, as an example, it's things like companies can be much cleverer about how they keep social and environmental goals and outcomes top of mind within any innovation process. They can ensure that innovation is open um, uh, and um, that will help make uh, supply chains, entire industries more sustainable and resilient by just gathering in better, more widespread ideas. They have to establish um, technology governance uh, mechanisms, seeing the, the, the incredibly disruptive effect of technology already today, it's only going to get uh, more so if you live in a world where technology can achieve anything, how do you actually decide what it should be allowed to achieve? We've got to get more effective governance mechanisms in place. Uh, and understanding this disruption, we also have to get people to, ready to work with new technology. So that's an idea of like a, you know, a shift in approach around technology. There's the same thing done for the other three enablers as well. You will notice when you come to your discussions in the breakout that these enablers map very closely to the, the, the actions that each are held within each pathway. And so essentially, each of the actions will at least have some element that links to one of these or, uh, enablers or require uh, um, this you know, one of these enablers to be uh, considered as you try to drive progress on that action. Uh, and I'll skip past this, but there's also a section in it where we outline like the major policies that companies have to agree on uh, if they're to have any success globally in advancing the kinds of transformations that are required. So finally, uh, the final section, time for leadership, and I'll do this very quickly. Basically, we just recap uh, what was in the original Vision 2050 conclusion. We show how that's still relevant today. We make a statement about uh, the the the reality of the challenges that we will face in driving, um, driving transformation of the scale required. We show how it's not going to be plain sailing. It is going to be tough. There will be barriers that have to be overcome. But we also show how this is a better time than there's been in 50 years to try and drive real change 
uh, catalyzed by some of the upheaval caused by the pandemic, but also uh, just the, we have reached the correct moment within our common site, guys, where we understand just how critical uh, these changes uh, and transformations are. It's really hard um, to, to ignore them. I know that you in Turkey have suffered some, some terrible tragedies over the past few weeks with the heat, and it's the same in other parts of the world as well. And then finally, we say that real leadership to drive these types of change will depend on three core factors. Firstly, that, that leaders hold a shared vision, and we hope that Vision 2050 provides them with everything that they need uh, in terms of what that shared vision should be. That they need to think systemically, and again, we hope that Vision 2050 provides a framework, at least, for the kinds of factors that need to be considered when you think systemically about how you're going to drive uh, your future resilience um, and prosperity. And then finally, that all of this is dependent on those mindset shifts that we laid out in section three, and that without um, understanding the fundamental mindset shifts that are required to drive change, we will simply not uh, drive change at the speed required for the challenges that we face. So with all that said, I'll stop. Uh, because I just want to make sure that you have a chance to do your breakouts and then I can share the, the deck with the available resources and the key messages afterwards. How's that, Conker? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian.